If you've got a Bible, and I really hope you do, turn with me to Judges chapter 3. If you don't, please don't leave the building without one. Go to the Info Center. We will get you set up so that you can read God's Word, not just on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week. Uh, I do know it's Palm Sunday. I have not forgotten. And we're going to do our best to get back there kind of on the tail end of this sermon, which seems, I know some of you are going, how are you going to get there from Judges chapter 3? Um... We'll do our best. I won't make any promises because if I fail, I don't want to set myself up that way. But but the quick, quick answer would be we continue to have a tyrant who rules over us and we continue to be a people in need of deliverance. And our great deliverer is Jesus. And this week is the moment of his victory and all that it represents and reminds us of. We're going to get back to that, but we're going to start in Judges chapter 3. Now I will, I'll I'll forewarn you, so about 20 years ago, um, I was pastoring a little church, and part of that meant that I I like inherited a Bible camp, so if you can picture me as a director of a Bible camp, I know that's a stretch, because it even, it was, Um, and a very glorified title, because a very small operation, but kind of got involved in leading it, and planning games, and even like meals, and all those kind of fun-filled things. But one of the, the special duties that came along as director of the Bible camp is that you also inherited the cabin that no one else wanted. Uh, so, thankfully, we we dismissed our kids, most of them. Uh, so the cabin that no one else wanted is grade three to five boys. And I'll just say this, if you are a parent of a grade three to five boy, just hang in there. Like, don't give up. Like they're just a different. They're just a different. The grade four was the year. I, I always tell this story. It was the year I discovered that I could pick my desk up and drive it around the classroom like a car. And my grade four teacher's name was Mrs. Wonker. And you can imagine the terror when she started coming to our church. I still remember that as a kid, just going, <laughs> "I'm in such trouble." But anyway, so I was leading the grade three to five boys. Now here's where the story gets interesting. There was a tradition in this camp, Rock Lake Bible Camp in East Kootenay. Some of you may know where that is. That at the, the last campfire of every week, each cabin would have picked a Bible story and they would act it out before all the rest of the campers. So typically, you know, the girls, all the sweet little girls, they would act out some sweet little, you know, Bible story. It was usually something to do with Jesus and a miracle, like he healed someone or he fed something or he calmed a storm. The storm was always a good one because you could get the canoe and they'd be out there shaking the canoe around and then Jesus would speak and, you know, it was, it was always good. Now, the grade three to five boys had no interest in calming water or healing people. And I would always try to sell them on some other, you know, exciting story from the Old Testament. And they would always, they would always veto it. They, they got to choose. And it seemed like every year we ended up in Judges chapter 3. In fact, I've seen Judges 3 acted out in all sorts of gruesome, horrific ways that only grade 3 to 5 boys can imagine. And we're there this morning, and I just say that because I kind of want to forewarn us. It is one of the most unusual, strange passages of Scripture. And if you're here this morning for the first time, please come back. We're not always in Judges 3, all right? Um, Okay, with all that, I know, now I'm really setting this up. Like, what is wrong with Judges 3? It's the story of Ehud killing a fat king, and that's not my words, those ones are in Scripture. We're going to get there in just a moment. But I do want to just remind you of one quick one quick thought, uh, particularly if you're wrestling with the violence of Scripture and you're kind of just sorting through faith things. I've talked about this before, and I've been asked this question. Actually, it's not even ever put to me as a question. It's more put to me as an accusation or a reason for rejecting a faith in God, the God of the Scripture. And it goes something like this. I could maybe believe in God if it wasn't for all the violence and horrible things he does in the Old Testament. But if the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the New Testament, I want nothing to do with him. All right, And it's a strange, strange sort of conversation to have. And here's what I want us to be able to do as a church. I want us to be able to have a response to that. So here's how I would respond. It would be something like this. Firstly, I, I make sure that I, we're talking specific. So usually what I'll say to someone in that is, could you tell me the exact story? What is it exactly you're wrestling with? Because I found a lot of people don't know. They just heard this stuff in the media or they've read it on Google, that somewhere in the Old Testament there's horrible things that happen. So it's good to actually ask what are the specifics. And inevitably, it will come down to one of the stories in Judges that that people are wrestling with. And then I would point out these three very important things. Number one, this is the judgment of God. This is not him just commanding his people to be wicked, terrible people doing these kind of things. This is his judgment. He announced it back in Genesis 400 years earlier. He had warned the people, and in his mercy and patience, he waited 400 years 
He gave these people 400 years, four centuries to turn from their ways. They refused, and he said, there will come a day when sin and wickedness will be judged. There's only two places in all of Scripture that are described like what Judges is. One is Noah and the ark and God's judgment on the world and the wickedness of that day. And the second one here in Judges. Then after that, the only other time that we look forward to, not look forward to in that sense, but still see as coming in terms of an event, is God's judgment at the end. So the idea that somehow the Bible is littered with this stuff is not accurate. Very few events, events of God's judgment, The last thing is that this is not to be an ongoing pattern for God's people. God didn't instruct the nation of Israel to be a people like this. In fact, he instructed them essentially to be a nation that was not interested or involved in conquest. They are going to be a peaceful people. And every law God gives to his people that will govern warfare puts them at a disadvantage. In other words, unless God shows up when Israel goes to war, they are guaranteed to lose because the kind of rules he leaves them with, the laws he leaves them with, guarantee that no one can win having to follow and abide by the ways God asks asks his people to live. Now, when we fast forward to the New Testament, particularly to the week leading up to Jesus' death on a cross, Jesus gets involved in a few conversations. He's questioned, essentially. And in part, he comes to this, this moment where he says, you know what? Essentially, if my kingdom was of this world, my followers would raise swords, but my kingdom is not of this world. That's why they don't pick up swords. And he goes to the cross and dies. And the kingdom of Jesus Christ that we are a part of is not a sword-bearing kingdom. In fact, it's precisely the opposite. We are the people who will lay down our lives for our faith, not raise a sword for it, in following our Savior and Lord. And I think it's important to know those things as we jump into a story like this that is full of things that thrill the hearts of great three to five boys. Here we go. Picking up, we're going to pick up in verse 12. <clears throat> Again, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites, the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel. They took possession of the city of Palms, and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Now, just so you know how I'm going to deal with this passage, we're going to break it up into like seven, I'm going to call them chapters. I'm going to like... I'm going to kind of imagine like this whole story from verse 12 to verse 31 is like a book that has basically seven pieces to it. So when you hear me saying chapters, I'm not talking about chapters of scripture, I'm talking about the ones I've made up, all right, just for me to be able to think this thing through. So I would say chapter one is Eglon Eglon takes over Israel and subjects its people to brutal conditions. That's chapter one. It's, It's not a... Nice rhyming title, but that's just kind of how I picture these first few verses. So here's the details we're told in the story. The people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, they knew who God was. He had delivered them last time, and they chose, they made the deliberate decision to reject that and follow some other God. We're not told the you know, details of what that looked like, but they reject God. They do evil again. It's an interesting description, isn't it? Because isn't that always the way of sin? There's something about sin that just always kind of has that feel to it. That you find yourself back again doing the same thing and again going, this didn't, this didn't give joy the way I thought. It almost reads, I don't know if you see it the way I do, it almost reads like this is just a boring, mundane thing. Not in the sense that it's not significant, but in the sense that it it doesn't fulfill the way they thought maybe it would. We're going to pursue these other gods. We're going to find joy in these other things. And all they do is they find themselves again in the same spot. Isn't sin like that? You ever find that? You're going to pursue this thing and it's going to do whatever it is that I hope it's going to do. It's going to really satisfy me. And then you do it. You wake up the next morning and you go, that didn't fulfill me. It left me feeling empty. And here's the sad irony of human nature, of our broken hearts. We don't, on that day, say, now I've learned the craziness of sin. Instead, we do exactly the opposite. We say, I'm going to try it again tomorrow. Maybe I'll have a different outcome. Sin always leaves you empty. It's its nature. Now, the second thing that I think is worth seeing in this is that sin also has both a natural and supernatural consequence to it. 
All right, you pick that up in the story. It's not a story where we find out that Israel was this strong military and Eglon was this strong militarily. And so Eglon's kingdom beats the Israelites. In fact, as we go through the rest of the story, we're going to see that Eglon essentially shows up almost, almost as a comedic sort of character. He is not, not at all an impressive seeming man. It's only because the Lord strengthened him. Did you get that point? It's shocking, isn't it? God is sovereign even in this, even in the consequences of sin towards his people. Now, sometimes the consequences of sin are entirely natural. We know this. If you, if you choose, uh, I'll just use this one. It's tax time, right? So if you choose to lie in your taxes and do that kind of thing, we probably shouldn't be shocked if the CRA shows up in our lives. Just, it's natural. That's how it works. Right? You choose to sin in a certain way, there's probably going to be natural consequences. And we know that, we understand that, but there's a second piece to it that shows up in this passage. Also, there can be supernatural consequences. In other words, the hand of God could show up. And we might say, well, I'm going to sin in this way. And I understand the consequences might be this. And so we kind of rationalize, am I prepared for those consequences? And we make this strange, broken decision where we say, yeah, I'm going to sin in this way. In the off chance, I can avoid those consequences. But what Israel finds over and over, and what probably you have found over and over in your life, is that they're not always just natural consequences. Sometimes God strengthens an Eglon in your life. And all of a sudden, you find yourself stuck in sin, going, this is a consequence I never imagined could come. And the hands of God, hand of God is at work. The last thing I see in these few verses before we get into the heart of the story would just be this. The thing that we worship will also become our master. If I could put it another way, the thing that we make our God will become our Lord. And in a Christian sense, that sounds like a good thing. We want God to be our Lord, but that same pattern holds true right across the board. If you pursue and elevate anything to the status of a thing that you're worshiping and setting up in your life as a small g God, be prepared for that thing to become your master. And I would say this, Emmanuel, choose your master wisely. Because we only see one in Scripture who is good and gracious. And it is the God of Scripture. All other things just destroy us. And what you worship will eventually master you. Israel sees that. They worship other gods. Isn't it interesting that the gods that they worship, these people are the very ones who come and oppress them. Now, the Moabites are actually related to the Israelites, so they're living just across the Jordan River. That's sort of the area, sort of geographically, so if you're kind of picturing a map of Israel, we're in the east part of the country. In fact, we're told it's the city of Palms, which is Jericho. How's that for irony? The first city that God actually gives to his people in a supernatural way. Now he delivers to their enemies in a supernatural way. He he empowers this king to do this. And the Moabites have come across the Jordan River, and they've now set up camp in Israel and have conquered We're not sure how much of the country, but a significant amount, and they have oppressed the people of Israel. Uh, A little bonus trivia thing for those who like this sort of thought. Uh, Ruth, the story of Ruth, which is coming up in your Bible pretty quick here. Um, She's a Moabite, so she's from this group of people. And actually, Jewish tradition, which is not scripture, so we're not going to say it's necessarily true or accurate, but Jewish tradition actually is that she is the daughter of King Eglon, who we're going to read about today, which may or may not be true, but... That's kind of one of the stories that they tell. But it is at least around the same time, around the same location, where Ruth comes from among these very people. They're actually the offspring of Lot. So go way back to Genesis 12, you meet Abraham, who will become sort of the the father of this nation. And his nephew Lot is the father of the Moabites, who now show up as the oppressors of Israel. And they oppress them for 18 years, which seems, seems like something you can read really quick. But stop and just think, where were you 18 years ago? Like, how long is that in your life? Because in my life, 18 years ago, there's a lot that's changed. That's a lot of chapters of my life ago. 18 years, Israel is oppressed by a people who cares nothing for them. They're just bent on whatever they can gain off the backs of this nation. They served Eglon for 18 years. Chapter 2 goes something like this. Israel sends Ehud to pay tribute to Eglon. So in these days, when these situations arose, where one kingdom 
captures another. The, the subjugated people has to pay their sort of lords, the king. They pay them something. Usually it's commodity. We're not talking often cash. And in this story, the words that are used lead us to think we're talking grain. So we're probably at the end of a harvest time of year. The Israelites have just harvested all their crops. They're going, we've got enough food to last us for the winter, except that now we have to take everything we've just harvested and give it to a foreign king, which means we're probably going to starve, which is exactly the situation. And in the middle of all that, God raises up a man named Ehud. Now here's the description in verse 15. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Now, interesting phrase, right? Uh, so we'll be really careful here in the second service. We had a number of lefties in the first who I think were starting to look like they were going to throw things at me. Any, any lefties? Just so I know what I'm like. Oh, ho. And you're sitting near the front. Most of the lefties in first service were up in the balcony, so I felt safe somehow. All right. Okay, Bruce, no offense. Don't throw anything at me. Here we go. Historically, but no longer today, we understood that left-handed people were somehow deficient. Sorry, lefties. That's why we tried to get you all to use your right hand. In fact, the Latin word for left-handed person is actually the word sinister. Isn't that good? It's like, oh, we don't trust you. You got your left hand. So, and by the word, the word dexterous, which means right-handed, was sort of a word that meant like gifted. And it's like all of us right-handed are gifted. And the lefties, you are sinister who are not to be trusted. Okay. It's important to know that because the description we just got told us two pieces of information about Ehud, right? First, he's a Benjamite. Second, he's left-handed. The left-handed part is actually even a little bit more strange than that because it's actually, it doesn't specifically say he's left-handed. It says that he is not able to use his right hand. So whether he's been injured, whether he was born with that, we're not really sure. It doesn't really say. Whatever the case might be, he is a left-handed Benjamite. Which means, firstly, being left-handed, he would not have been looked upon as someone who could be counted on or someone who could lead his people. In other words, this man does not qualify to lead anything. If you were looking at his resume and saying, we're taking applications for you know someone who will be the next deliverer of Israel, the fact that he puts left-handed down there on the resume means he's disqualified. And they all knew it. It, it was just as clear as, what do they say, the nose in your face, that kind of thing, Right? Adding to that is the fact that he's a Benjamite. Which again, it's like, what's so bad about being a Benjamite? Uh, The Benjamites in chapter 1 of Judges are the first tribe to just wholesale fail. The tribe of Judah gets it half right. You know, God raises them up first. They go up, they fight first. They kind of half get it right. By the time we work our way down to the Benjamites near the end of chapter 1, the Benjamites just totally get it wrong. They become essentially the black sheep of the the nation of Israel, the one tribe that's looked down. And in fact, by chapter 19 and 20, which in a strange, ironic twist, actually probably is historically near the start of the story, because by chapter 19 and 20, Moses' grandson and Aaron's grandson both show up in the story, which means, if you kind of work through the chronology of it, 19 and 20 can't actually be the end. It actually is this strange literary twist where you read through the whole story only to discover that the end is the start. It's kind of like a great movie. And in chapter 19 and 20, we read that the entire nation of Israel tries to wipe out the tribe of Benjamin. They try to kill them all because they are viewed as just sort of the the black sheep. They get everything wrong. And so out of all that, who do we have that God raises up to be the deliverer of his people? A left-handed Benjamite, meaning you shouldn't have been there. If anyone did not qualify for this role, Ehud was your guy, and yet the Lord raises him up for this very thing. And we continue to read that the people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Verse 16, Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, about a cubit in length. So that's kind of the length of your elbow to to hand, about 18 inches roughly. And he sent, uh, sorry, uh, where were we here? I lost my place. Verse 16. And he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes, which will become important because this is the one guy who can sneak into a king's throne room. And if they do sort of the pat down looking for weapons, they're not going to check for this guy because a left-handed man can't fight. He's viewed as deficient. He's not able. He doesn't have the skill. He doesn't have the character. He's not going to be a man who's trusted to carry a weapon. And so he's able to sneak the weapon into the throne room. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 17, he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. All right, I'll stop there, because I 
Sometimes when you get a verse like that, you just have to read it. It's actually worse than it even reads. You want to know that? His name actually means little cow. And the word very fat is actually like, you kind of get the picture, it's like he has been exceedingly fattened up. He's an exceedingly fat little cow. That's actually in the Bible. I didn't make that up. And I'll never probably get to say that again. Because <laughs> the board will say, we don't want you preaching from judges anymore. Uh, it's actually important because the whole, the whole dynamic behind the passage is egg, a, Ehud, sorry, bringing tribute. And the word tribute is the same word that we would have for bringing a grain offering to God. And he draws near to Eglon, which is the same language that would have been used for the Israelites drawing near to God to present a grain offering. And you get the dynamic that's going on here behind the story? Ehud should be doing the very thing he's doing, but it should have been an act of worship towards God. And instead he's doing it in an act of worship towards a fattened cow. In other words, everything about this story is wrong. It's so offensive to God it's so broken. This should not be happening. But there he is with the tribute. Now, the, the next part of it is he sends away the people who are with him. Evidently, the tribute he's bringing, all this grain, is a significant quantity, so it takes a, a crew of guys to do it. So when he had finished presenting the tribute, verse 18, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, and all the attendants went out from his presence. And he had came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber, and he had said, I have a message from God. God for you, and he arose from his seat. He who had reached with his left hand, took the sword from, from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. There's the heart of the story. Now you see why every grade three to five boy loves this. Oh, I should probably the next verse. And the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and dung came out. Yes, it's right there in the Bible. And grade three to five boys, wow, can they ever put a flair to that story. God executes judgment on an arrogant, proud man who was never qualified to be a king, to be a leader. He was a vicious, terrible tyrant. And yet, if you're like me, you still kind of struggle even a little bit with the humor of it. Is it right to laugh at that? It's written as though it's kind of funny. The description is unusual, and yet there's a part of us that struggles like this. This is in our Bible. This is, God is behind this. God has raised up this man and had him do it. I just remind you what I've said to you over and over again. Not everything described in this story is being held up as a model of virtue. Some of the things that are being done are not virtuous at all. God is still at work behind the whole thing. But it's not a template saying, here's what God commends. He loves this kind of thing necessarily. It's not the point. The point is we're seeing God's judgment executed in the middle of sin and chaos now. But now we've gotten to the heart of our story where, where Eglon has been killed. Uh, By the way, that little secret thing, let me just throw out one last little idea before we move on to what I'm going to call chapter 4. Ehud comes, you hear the language, King, I have a secret for you. Uh, Be careful of secrets. I I don't mean to moralize the whole story and say now this is a lesson about keeping secrets and gossip, but let me just say something about keeping secrets and gossip. You see what happens for Eglon? It's this, oh, you got a secret? I I love secrets. And as a result of it, he ends up dead. Now, when someone comes to you and says, can I tell you a secret? I mean, use your judgment. Obviously, there's times and places, I suppose, for it. But you want to know what? Most of the times in my life when people have come to me and said, hey, can I tell you a secret? It's either, number one, something I should not be hearing because it's gossip. Or number two, it's something that after I hear, I'm left with this huge burden going. Now someone's told me a secret and I'm... Now I don't know what to do with the information. I need to act upon this, but it's been entrusted to me. So usually when people come to me now and say, I got a secret for you, I just say this. If you trust me enough with this piece of information, you'll have to trust me enough to know whether I should keep it to myself or share it with someone else. It's kind of gotten me off the hook a few times. But for this this man, this this desire to know information, ooh, to be entrusted with a secret, it's going to cost him his life. Chapter 5. Meanwhile... Outside the throne room, the king's bodyguards are waiting. Verse 24. 
When he had gone, so he had kills him and then flees. The servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet in a cool chamber, and they waited till they were embarrassed. And you are embarrassed at me reading this, <laughs> right? Because you realize, you, re- you get why they thought that, right? He was killed, and when he was killed, his bowels released. He, talks, he dies, and, and now they're outside the door going, we're not sure whether to go in or not. And why do they conclude that they can't go in? They conclude he's using the facilities probably because of what they can smell. And again, we're back to this strange moment going, I get why a grade three to five boy loves this and laughs. But it's uncomfortable, is it not? Well, what do we do with this kind of stuff in Scripture? Okay. We're almost done through our story and then we're going to try to apply it here a little bit. I know you're wondering where this goes, right? Chapter 5, Ehud returns and rallies the Ephraimites from ba- for battle. Verse 26, Ehud escaped, and while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to uh, Syrah. And when he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. The people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. Isn't that ironic? A left-handed Benjamin, Benjamin is now leading the people. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So he rallies the nation of Israel now behind him. He's now leading the whole nation, having done this. And the nation responds. Why? Because God's in it. Notice Ehud doesn't say, look, the amazing thing I've done. Look at the courage I had. All you were too chicken. You stayed home, but I, I have freed you. No, he, he gets it right. He points to God. God's the one who's done this. God's the one who's given victory. God's the one who will continue to give victory. Chapter 6, the Moabite army is defeated, and I would add completely and totally defeated. The description we actually get in verse 28 and 29 is of a a very strong army, the Moabites, being utterly destroyed. In other words, when God wants to deal with his enemies, he can do the job completely. He's not going to be limited. He's not going to run out of strength. All the language to describe the Moabites describes them as a strong, fit military force. They are not an emancipated crew at the end of a long battle where they're worn out and battle-wearied and they can't do much. No, they are a highly efficient, strong, fighting group, an army, and somehow this ragtag group of Israelite farmers who are not an army is able to defeat them and strikes down every last man because God's with them. Chapter 7, the final chapter. Then there was 80 years of rest. It's there, right there in verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day in the hand, under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Again, the mercy of God in all this is an interesting thing. The last story, Othniel, there's eight years they're oppressed, and then there's 40 years where they have rest. Now they are oppressed for 18 years, and then they get 80 years of rest. Okay, but the story's not done. Those are our seven chapters, and we're tempted to kind of end the story right there. In fact, my Bible has a heading uh, before the next verse that says Shamgar, and I just, careful of crossing things out, but I don't think it should be there, because I don't think we're done Ehud's story yet, because if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, it reads this way, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So chapter 4 basically says Ehud's story is still kind of going on, but then interjected into the middle of it is another story, a story of Shamgar, another man that God raises up, I believe that, because of what chapter 10, verse 11 says about him, that the Lord wins a victory over the Philistines, and this is the only moment prior to chapter 10, 11, that the Philistines are involved at all. So basically, God's taking credit for verse 31 of raising up this next man, Shamgar, of whom we are told virtually nothing other than he is the son of Anath, and he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, which is about a six foot long wooden pole with sort of a metal point, normally used to kind of push and direct cattle along. God raises him up and is able to save Israel. Now, if you kind of are picturing a map of Israel, I'll do it from your side. So, east, this side, we've got Moab down here. On the west, we have the Philistines who have come by boat and landed on the coast of Israel. They had intended to march south and defeat the Egyptians, but they got south, waged war against the Egyptians, lost, came back up north and decided rather than get on our boats and go home, we'll just live here. 
And they arrive pretty much the same time as the Israelites cross over the Jordan from wandering in the wilderness. So you've got the Philistines coming from the west and the Israelites coming from the east. And apparently, right as Ehud is delivering them from Moab, the Philistines are starting to cause trouble in the other side of the nation in the west. In fact, Deborah sings a song in chapter 5, verse 6, and she talks about the, the Philistines causing trouble on the highways. They came with chariots. They were iron workers, so they were able to be highly mobile. And they're causing issues to to the west and this fellow Shamgar single-handedly is raised up by the Lord to deliver Israel. Now here's all we know about him. This is going to be interesting. Number one, he doesn't have a Hebrew name. Shamgar is not a Hebrew name. It's a Canaanite name. Number two, he's the son of Anath. Now usually, it's pretty typical, right, in your Bible to read son of and then you get the father, right? You know, son of David. Solomon's the son of David, right? That means David's his father. That's the lineage. Here's the odd part of this. And it's always the father. It's always son of and then the name of the father. Here's the odd part. Anath is actually a woman's name. So it's a feminine word. So it's, we got Shamgar, a guy that's got a Canaanite name, who's the son of what sounds like a woman, except that this woman's name is actually the name of a Canaanite goddess of war and sex. And God... God, now we've got two options. Either he is an Israelite who comes from a family that has become so Canaanized that they would name their son, not, not by Hebrew names, but by a Canaanite name, and then sort of dedicate him to a false god. Or we have God actually raising up a Canaanite to save his people. I'm not sure which. Either creates spectacular issues, and it creates an amazing scene of the mercy of God. Is it not? God raising up someone who is completely unexpected. And the reason I think Shamgar's story is inserted right in the middle there of Ehud's story is God's wanting us to see he is now in the business of raising up people that you do not expect to deliver anyone. Isn't that great? Don't hold them up as heroes. That's, what, that's not what Judges is trying to say. It's not trying to say these are heroic men. God's holding them up and saying I can work through anyone and I will deliver my people. Okay, what are we supposed to learn from this? I want to try seven quick things. We got time. I'll, I'll move quick through them. Number one is exactly what I was just referring to. God works in a variety of ways. More specifically, he uses a variety of people. And the reason I think that's important is because after having the joy of pastoring like for about 20 years now, I have heard every reason under the sun of why people cannot be used in God's service, why they have disqualified themselves from ministry. And I used to think it was all excuses. Like I, used to, I would say to myself, I've heard every excuse under the sun of why people... Somewhere along the line, I learned something. I've learned that this is my assumption of you, that you, you want to serve. I mean, if I was to say, who wants to serve the King of Kings and make a difference with their lives? I don't think there's anyone who wouldn't put up their hand. Of course we do. It's just like with giving. I don't, I don't apologize when we do an Easter offering. I don't apologize. We totally understand not everyone's in a spot where they can give. But if I said, who, who wishes they had the resources to give towards doing something that's going to make a difference in someone's life? It's like, of course I do. I've maybe not always had the means, but it's not that I don't, it's not that I'm sitting there demoing to myself. It's like, no, I do not want to give where I can make a difference. I'd rather just not. No, we want, which of us says, you know what, I really don't care about my prayer life. No, I don't, I don't want to pray. No, we, of course I want to. I've got all these human frailties and all these issues. I wish they weren't there. I want to be able to do better. I've got the want to. I believe people actually want to serve the Lord, and yet they have convinced themselves, and maybe you have, of 101 reasons why you don't qualify. There's someone else, you've seen it do better, you know all the flaws of your heart, you know all the sins going on, you know all the issues, you don't have the skill, don't have the experience, and here's what I'd want you to see from these two stories. God can use anyone, because it isn't about our weakness, or our strength, sorry, or our ability. It's about God. He takes the most unqualified men and women and raises them up and says, I'm going to use them. Because when I can use them, it shows you I can use anyone. And if you're sitting here and have disqualified yourself, it's going to go, you don't know my story. Your story is pretty much irrelevant. God can work through all of us. Don't disqualify yourself from ministry. Second 
I think, important lesson that comes out of this story is that the only thing that seems to matter isn't the ability, the experience. I mean, Shamgar was not a soldier. He uses an ox goad, for goodness sakes. This is not even a weapon. And he defeats, I mean, 600 is actually a military unit. It seems like what's being described to us is this farmer with an ox goad goes into hand-to-hand combat with an organized Philistine military unit. The only thing God wants is trust. Anyone can be used, but the second thing is that, that all God's looking for is trust. Because when I see these two men and consider their stories, the one thing I see a healthy dose of is trust. What makes Ehud think he can fashion a sword, walk into a throne room, and kill a man, and get out, and lead a nation to fight against an organized Moabite army that's fit and ready and equipped? The only thing he's got is God told me to do it. And I trust that he will be there. What makes Shamgar think he can take an ox goat and fight 600 men? The only thing is that God has raised him up and asked him to do that. We don't know in his case how. I mean, Gideon sees an angel. You know, Samson's going to have, you know, his parents are going to have a vision, a dream, and all those kind of things. God speaks, he communicates. But these people simply trust. And all God's looking for is that you will trust him to do what he asks of you. The third thing is this. We have a God who laughs. Not like ha-ha at jokes. If you read Psalm 2, verse 4, God laughs at his enemies. Not, again, let me qualify this really carefully so we understand what's going on in places like Psalm 2 and this story. It's not that God is callous towards sin and laughs it off as though it's excusable. It's not that God is callous towards the suffering of people and laughs at their pain. He laughs, Psalm 2 tells us, at the kings and tyrants of our world who think they are something. But their power and their strength is so small that relative to God, it's a laughable thing in his eyes that they think they can rise up against him. And I think that's what's going on behind this whole, this whole chapter where we wrestle. It's like, why does God put it in these sort of almost borderline comic sort of bizarre terms where he gives us these descriptions? It's only for one reason, to expose the weakness and folly of any human who thinks they can stand up to God and be something. In fact, that's what Psalm 2 is all about. It's a warning. In fact, it gets down a little bit later by verse 10. It says, therefore, be warned. Therefore, be warned. Because God is much. And we are exceedingly little. Number four, he hears groanings. I'm thankful for that. I've had a couple seasons in my life where that's about all that would come out. You just don't even know anymore how to pray. You're not even sure what you're asking for. And all you have is enough faith to just come before the Lord and it's just kind of a cry for help. And he hears that. He did. He did for his people. They had done what was evil in his sight, but... Verse 15 tells us when they cried out, God showed up. And if that's all you've got today, you're sitting here and you've cleaned up really well and it looks good and you've made it look good to the rest of us and we have no clue at how difficult things have gotten. Know that the Lord is in the business of hearing the groanings of his people. But, number five, his work is not often easy to see. And I wish it was. I wish when God showed up and when he worked on behalf of his people that it was just obvious. And I, and I think most of the story here is actually a story of things that weren't obvious. God was at work, but it would not have seemed like it to the human eye. And that seems to be consistent through scripture where he's at work behind the scenes doing things for his people and they failed to recognize it. And they're even sometimes coming to him and longing him. It's the story of Elijah, right? What does Elijah want? He wants to see the glory and power and splendor of the Lord and he doesn't get to see it. He thinks he's not seeing it. And the whole time God's at work. The whole time. And if you're sitting here today saying, I have been groaning, but why is he not showing up? My guess is he's already at work. And you just haven't quite got to see it yet. Number six. One day ox goats will just be ox goats. Mike 4 puts it much more eloquently than that. The swords will be hammered into farming implements. 
Because there'll be no more of this. There'll be no more tyrants. There'll be no more things oppressing. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more battle in your heart or saying, why am I back at this crazy spot again where I've worshipped something other than God and now I'm facing the oppression of my own sin needing deliverance? Why am I facing the oppression of someone else's sin where they've messed up and I'm facing the consequence of their sin? One day it all ends. And that is an awesome thing. And I can't guarantee when that day will be for you. But one day, Scripture tells us, it all ends. Lastly, each one of us kind of lives through this crazy cycle. (laughs) The crazy cycle that's described over and over. I see myself in it. When I look at this story, I don't look and go, hey, I'm kind of the Ehud of the story. I look and I go, I'm the Israelites doing the same crazy stuff again. Desperately in need of a deliverer. And his name is Jesus. And it's precisely what he came to do. There's actually an interesting thing that goes on in the book of Judges. You'll see it as we work through the stories. Fewer and fewer and fewer people get involved in the deliverance that God brings. In the first story, Othniel, it's him and the whole nation. In this story, it's Ehud and the whole, seemingly the whole nation are called. And as we get further and further, there's fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer people. By the time we get to Samson's story, there's no indication of anyone other than Samson being raised up. And he is the most broken, sinful man of the whole book. And then we arrive in the New Testament. You know where this is going. Jesus put on trial. And how many stand with him? None. And what do they do? They look at him and they, everything about them makes them mock him. Even when he's on the cross, if you really are the son of God, if you're really able to, you, you can save others, save yourself, come down. The whole thing is a mockery. They look and they say, you are not a fit deliverer. You can't even deliver yourself. Not having a clue that at that precise moment, he was dying for for me. And for you. Then he offers this incredible gift. He says, I just want my people to go out and I want them to proclaim news. That's it. I'm not respond we're not responsible to convert anyone. We're just responsible to proclaim the news. And here's what the news is. We are hopelessly broken people, stuck in an insane cycle of sin and chaos, separated from God, apart from God, with no hope on our own. And God sent his one and only son, and here's the good news. He died on the cross in our place and paid that price and rose to life again, beating sin and death. And then it says, simply by faith and trust, turning from your brokenness and your sin, you can have forgiveness and eternal life. You can be reconciled to God. What an amazing, amazing deliverer. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this story. As we think of Palm Sunday and all that it represents, all that it reminds us to, all that it points us to, we think of Jesus Christ on his own, walking into a city, weeping, because he and he alone knew the terms of peace. It would mean him dying on a cross. There was no other way. And so, Father, we are just absolutely humbled and in awe that our great deliverer, sinless, perfect, flawless, would die in our place and rescue us forever. So Father, help us to take to heart the things that your word shows us about who you are, a perfect holy God of who Jesus is, a flawless, wonderful Savior and deliverer, and who we are, a people in need. And help us to receive that incredible offer incredible salvation and incredible rest that he promises to us that we can truly be at peace. We thank you and we love you in Christ's name. Amen.